The Boy in White It was in the stifling heat of the afternoon on the 23rd of August 1960 that a cruel murder took place. In the 60 years since, the details of this crime have raised more and more questions. Although many people remember what happened, the final verdict might not reflect the truth. In this exploration, I will try to establish the facts around this case. At 7.45 p.m., Police Constable Carmelo Attard was doing his rounds walking the streets of Valletta when he was hailed by a panic-stricken man beckoning him to St. Dominic Street. A boy has fallen out of the window, he claimed. When the constable arrived at the scene, he found no boy outside. He made his way inside, finding drops of blood and bloody handprints in the staircase leading up to the apartment. An eight-year-old boy, Tuani Aquilina, was found lying in a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. His throat was cut almost ear to ear. The Accused Born Luigia Camilleri in 1927, she was known by a shortened form of her name, Gigia. As a child, growing up in her hometown of Sidjiwi, she would help her family with manual labour in the fields. Later, she worked as a barmaid and housemaid. One source said she was also a prostitute, however, it is possible that this rumour was started because she lived in Valletta, and this area was where British Navy workers would look for sex workers. She also had two children out of wedlock, quite a scandalous thing at the time. However, I cannot say for sure what the truth was. Emmanuel Camilleri, known as Lely, was a marine engineer and also occasionally worked as an auto mechanic. Gija would also do occasional seamstress work in her home. Gija and Lely married in 1957. She was 29 and he was 24. Her two children, born out of wedlock, were Twani and Carmen, and she also had one child, Martez, from her marriage to Lely. The family of five lived in a modest apartment in Valletta, which was composed of just two rooms. In this case, social context plays an important role. The area of St. Dominic Street in Valletta, where the murder took place, was a slum, where several floors of tenements housed residents living in poverty, low levels of education and poorly skilled workers. The Maltese Islands at the time were still going through a post-war depression with widespread poverty and a shortage of food. Nearby recreational areas where the family would often frequent were called il fossa, that means the cesspit, and il mandra, that is the landfill. Many villages in Malta at the time had a strong communal atmosphere. This means that all people living in community were neighbours and everyone knew everyone else's business. To a certain extent this is still true today. The murder the autopsy performed on Twani showed great brutality. Before his throat was sliced, Twani was savagely beaten with a deadbolt. This resulted in deep lacerations to his skull that medical examiners concluded had left the boy unconscious. In fact, police officers testified that they found pieces of the child's skull and brain within the pool of blood at the crime scene. The boy also had scratches and bruises on the back and front of his body. On the kitchen table, above the body, police found three significant items, a deadbolt, a knife and a belt. The T-shaped deadbolt, which was used to secure the front door from the inside, was confirmed to be the source of the head injuries on the young victim. The belt was used to beat Twani as confirmed by his sister in her witness testimony. The bread knife found in the drawer of the kitchen table was around a foot in length and covered in blood. In the same room, there was a small bed where Twani used to sleep. The bed was found to be clean. However, a bed cover was hanging over the metal railing of the apartment's balcony. This was examined by a blood evidence expert brought in from Scotland Yard to aid the investigation. The bed cover was found to have, quote, washed areas of blood stains, end quote. In the other room, there was a washing machine with bloody marks on it. 
the investigators took the machine apart and tested the soapy water, which remained in the exit pipe. This was found to contain blood, showing that the washing machine was used to clean bloody fabric. The prosecution suggested that after the boy received blows to the head, he tried to escape through the staircase. In his state, he could not navigate the steps and fell, coming to a stop at the flat area separating one set of stairs from the next. Blood and brain matter were found dripping down several steps. A resident of the apartment block, 14-year-old Alfred Fitzpatrick, recounted during the trial that he saw Jija carrying the boy up to the apartment. He also heard the sound of a metal object falling to the floor. Twenty's sister Carmen, aged just eight at the time, gave her testimony to the court. She recalled that the young boy had been washing the floor when he got distracted and picked up his father's tools to fix a tear in his shoes. Their mother reacted angrily and beat him with a leather strap. He called out to his sister, but Jija carried him into the kitchen. The girl said that her mother sent her to wait outside the building but she remained outside the apartment door and later saw her parents changing their clothes. Around 4.30 p.m. that day, Lely had been to the barber and had his hair cut. Hair clippings were later found on his clothing and also on the victim. Some background on Twani. After his birth, Twani was cared for by a friend of Jija's against payment. He was taken back by his mother at the age of four. Jija's father also offered to take custody of the boy, but Jija wouldn't hear of it. The boy's teacher said he did reasonably well at school and wanted to become a priest, but due to his illegitimate birth, it could not happen. Twani would sometimes get up to mischief by rifling through drawers or stealing money from his parents. Abuse During the trial, it was said that Twani was kind of the scapegoat of the family always being blamed when things went missing or were broken. For his mischief, it was said that he was regularly beaten by both his parents. However, Lely was the bringer of punishment in the household. Witnesses recalled seeing him tie up Twani in the apartment's balcony, or tying him to the bed by the neck. They said that he would beat the boy with a rolling pin or a leather belt and burn him with a cigarette. Witness Confusion a question is raised about the reliability of the testimony of children. Three of the witnesses during the court case were children aged eight or below. Several witness statements contradicted each other when it came to details such as what time events occurred or who was seen walking in which direction. During their testimony, there were contradictions between Alfred Fitzpatrick and Dolor Kauki, both neighbors living in the same tenement block. Dolor Kauki was arrested twice for giving confusing evidence and called a liar by the court. Sometimes the case may be that rumors are held as facts without any investigation. At the time, gossip was used as a means of social control. It could be used as a weapon, which seems pretty important, especially if you consider the rumors about Jija being a prostitute. The verdict. Jija Camilleri and Lely Camilleri were charged with murdering their son, a charge which they both denied, in a sensational court case lasting 17 days, now called the crime of the century. They were found guilty. Lely was sentenced to 20 years in prison and Jija was sentenced to death. However, there was enough doubt that over 80 lawyers and legal advisers lodged a petition following the verdict and sentence accusing the courts of miscarriage of facts and evidence. This resulted in Jija's sentence being changed to life in prison. Interestingly, the course of events follows a pattern of four other cases where female criminals had the same change of sentence. The Maltese would not allow a female to be executed for her crime. Quote, the lawyer's petition was based on various facts presented in court, where strong and reasonable doubts were not ruled out, end quote, said Raymond Zammit in his book about this crime. Jija's life after prison. Jija was released in 1970 
after nine years of good behavior in the Maltese prison system. She lived for some time in Australia with her daughter Carmen, but moved back to Malta to live alone in a humble flat in Cospicua. Gigia's notoriety was not forgotten in Maltese society. Over the years she gave some interviews, every time protesting her innocence and insisting that she did not kill her son. A TV interview was filmed at her small home in Cospicua. Gigia sat amongst an array of photos of Twani, wearing the special white suit of his Holy Communion. The little boy looks angelic and otherworldly in these photos, surrounded by flowers and candles. Here are her words. Lillibni nitolbu bis ya'la lil grazia lim arhames minuti abel mammut, isir maruf min kin li atlu. Kif yistai kun, om to'to lil bina. Translated, that means, My dear child, please grant me the grace that at the moment before my death I will find out who killed you. How could a mother kill her son? Gija visited Twani's grave every Sunday, brushing away any dirt and laying fresh flowers. She would also talk to her dead child tenderly. She died of natural causes in 1996, aged 69. She was buried in a tomb for residents of Cotonera. It is kind of a pauper's grave, as there is no marker bearing her name. In 2013, Maltese TV programme Shara Bank did a very special interview with Carmen, Gija's daughter. Now a middle-aged woman, she looks exactly like her mother. Although Carmen had since established her life in Australia, she came back to Malta and visited her old home in Valletta. In this interview, she says she is sure that her parents didn't commit this crime. At the time of the trial, she felt she was coerced into saying what the court wanted to hear, that Gija and Leli committed the murder. A few questions. If the parents didn't do it, then who did and why? The accusations of abuse are quite horrific. However, the doctors who examined the body confirmed that they didn't find any marks corresponding to bell flashings. Did the coroner find any old cigarette burns on the boy's body? A key witness, Alfred Fitzpatrick, 14 years old at the time, left bloody fingerprints at the scene. What was his involvement in the case? Why was his reaction to the horrific murder scene to wash his hands and leave? Why didn't he alert the police? Why was Gija sentenced to the death penalty when Leli received a sentence of life imprisonment? Gija was followed by the media well after her release from prison. However, nothing is known of Leli. Why did this crime focus on her and what happened to him? Strong doubts. Strong doubts on Gija's involvement have emerged over the decades and through research into this case. From witness statements made during the trial, it seems to me that the crime scene was certainly contaminated. Several people confirmed that they had looked inside the kitchen and seen the boy lying bloody and battered on the floor. Fitzpatrick even went as far as to say that he touched the boy and then washed his hands in the kitchen sink. A fingerprint expert examined the scene and over 200 people were brought into the police department to have their fingerprints taken. Despite this, the handprint on the bloody kitchen knife could not be identified. Did the jurors give too much importance to hearsay evidence? How far can the testimony of children be trusted? From the many, many witness statements, what was truth and what was a combination of rumour and assumption? With the benefit of hindsight, I think that Gija and Leli suffered an unforgivable injustice. That they weren't presumed innocent until proven guilty. They were assumed guilty. An alternative ending. Could this horrible crime have been committed by another person? Someone who had easy access to the apartment, was known by the family and inserted himself into the investigation? My suspicions lie with the teenager Alfred Fitzpatrick. It looks like a crime of opportunity, where the killer used weapons at hand, starting with the deadbolt and finishing with the bread knife. If you can set aside the confused and later recounted words said by Carmen, then 
Alfred Fitzpatrick was the only person to claim he saw Gija carrying 20 into the apartment. Alfred Fitzpatrick tried to justify any forensic evidence placing him at the scene by saying he went in, saw the boy, touched him and washed his hands. Yet he didn't call the police or say anything about the dead body he had just seen. The only thing that leaves me baffled is motive. What do you think about this? Was there something fishy going on or was justice served?